Hi, everybody, and welcome to another F Word, a filmed podcast that inspires a more vibrant, healthier, and wealthier 50-plus lifestyle. I'm your host, Vital Germain. I'm 56 years old. I look good, and I feel even better. Please don't hate. Let's dive straight in with my next guest. Let's welcome to the stage the one and only Wayne. Come on in, Wayne. How are you doing, Wayne? I'm good, buddy. How are you? I'm doing great. Great to see you. Uh, right off the bat, Wayne, how old are you? I am, shockingly enough, 59 years old. 59 years old, looking good. How old do you feel? Oh, man, that depends on the day. I, 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 I think most people our age have the same thing. We vision ourselves whatever age we were kind of at our maximum, and then we go by the mirror and go, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then sometimes the world sends you a reminder, right? Like you get the senior discount without asking for it. I remember hitting 50, getting invitations to, what is it, AARP and things like that. And I was like, oh no, I'm officially old. I remember getting the very first hair in my ear. That was like, okay, you've officially reached it now. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, the worst one was I was at a conference last year, you know, when we were allowed to have conferences. <laughs> and I'm walking the floor and it's a training conference. There's all these training companies and software companies. And then the CIA has a booth. And me being me, I had to go up and go, okay, why is the CIA at a training conference? And they said, well, you know, we do all this internal training. We're looking for folks. Would you like to apply? And I kind of busted up. I went, no, no, no. Trust me, the CIA is not going to let me train for them. Right. And she looked at me and said, oh, don't worry. There's no age. Ouch. Limit. Ouch. <laughs> I had 10 reasons yeah. I could not pass a security clearance. Being old was not one of them. Now, you are from, you are from outside of the US. You are Canadian. Would that have played a part? Well, Would that was kind of my number one thing, right, is I'm yeah. not a US citizen. And then, you know, you start going into my deep, dark past and realize that this so, is not going to work. But somehow, being too old for the CIA never really occurred to me. Uh, well, that's well. You know what? That's a revelation for you. That's actually a reminder that age is mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. And for certain positions, we should eliminate the fact of how old we are, and maybe eliminate that limiting belief. I want to quickly tap into something you mentioned that you were there to train. Now, yeah. you you're a trainer. You're a coach. Am I am I correct? Or do you do both? Uh, well. I'm more of a consultant than a, a consultant. coach. Well, I do some coaching. It's mostly consulting and training. But yet you've chosen, it makes sense, Vegas is home, a lot of conferences, or there used to be a lot of conferences. Um, so maybe there's a logical reason for, for coming to Vegas, coming to America. In, no, in, there's, no, every 15 years I change corners of the continent, whether I need it or not. So let me ask uh, you this then. So you've traveled a lot. What yeah. value has traveling brought to you, who you've become, the work that you do? Well, it's immense. It's got an immense value. Having lived in you know, two countries and five different corners of them, um, one of the things about me is that I moved around a lot as a kid. People who bounce around a lot as kids, I think, one of two things happen. Either you figure out where you're going to be and grow very deep roots, yeah. never to be moved again, or you essentially become a nomad. And my two sisters have grown extremely deep roots, and I'm just kind of blowing around. I mean, Vegas had less to do with conferences and all kinds of good rational reasons as my bride, who was raised in Miami and lived in LA for 30 years, informed me that she had survived her last Chicago winter, and should I choose to continue <laughs> living with her, it would be somewhere warmer. I, that makes perfect sense. I, by the way, I was in Chicago for, what was that, the Polar Vortex a couple of years ago? Was that last year, two years ago? Uh, it's every year, pull up the seat, <laughs> yeah. So in a perfect world, yeah, money's not an issue, health, not an, there, there are no issues. You simply get to, I want to live there. Why would you choose that place and where would it be? You know, I'm not entirely sure I'm not there. 
Wow. Um, and the reason I say that is you got to live somewhere. It doesn't mean you can't ever leave. Right? If the question is you have to be in one place for the rest of your existence, it might be a different answer. But it meets my wife's qualifications, so happy wife, happy life. Yeah. Um, it's a good, for a Canadian, I don't know that I could go back and live full time in Canada because of the weather. I have completely wimped out. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you mentioned you know, your, your wife. You've given you, you're giving your wife a lot of credit here, and I've actually had the privilege of meeting the lovely lady. Yes. Relationships, not an easy thing to navigate. In fact, a very complicated thing to navigate. Whether you're Canadian, American, no matter where you live in the world, how long have you been married? Uh, we are going to be to well, we just were 29 years together last week. And we will be 28 years married the 1st of November. Congratulations on that. So here's the question. How on earth has she put up with you for 28 years on a, on a, on a deeper level? What have you found to be key factors as to the success yeah. of your relationship? It, it's funny because we both had first marriages that were wildly unsuccessful. Um, I think part of it and, and, you know, at the risk of, like, getting all serious and sounding like I know what I'm talking about, which I don't. Uh, but I think the thing about marriage is you have to go in assuming that it is a partnership. And you have to be willing to give up a certain amount. I mean, I can literally count on one hand the number of real fights the Duchess and I have had. Um, we've had disagreements, we get snarky, we stomp out of the room, but real fights, we haven't had them. And the reason is we like each other, and if the person, and she's a reasonable woman, so if she's really, really digging her heels in, or I'm really, really saying, no, 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 it has to be this way, odds are they're serious, and so if it doesn't matter to you, just let it go. Wow. By the way, would you like to hear what she said about you, Wayne? I would, as a matter of fact. <laughs> no, she, um, I mean, I, I had a chat with her when we, we had a, a, an event at somebody's pool, and I had a delightful chat with your, with your duchess, wonderful yes. lady. So you said that it's a, a, a partnership. Now, I've gone in with that mindset. A lot of people out there, a lot of listeners have gone in with that very mindset. But it's not that simple. So you mentioned you've had a, a handful of fights. So you have this fight. It's one of your major fights that you can count on your hand. How do you come back to that place of love? How do you come back to that place of honor, respect? Well, it, it, you said it, and it's really interesting. Um, I didn't expect to have this conversation today, but I'm glad to do it because I haven't had it in a long time. Um, I subscribe to what I call the Jiffy Lube theory of relationship maintenance. <laughs> okay, I'm all ears. Okay, it probably requires a little more explanation than that. <laughs> um, you know that you should get your car oil changed every 3,000-ish miles. And we also know, this being 2020, your car can go way longer than 3,000 miles. Right. But if you get your oil changed every 3,000 miles, you eliminate some potential problems. While they're changing the oil, they go, hey, did you see this happening over here? You might want to think about doing something about that. If you get your oil changed on a regular basis, your car will run longer, and you will have fewer problems, and you can prevent problems before they start. Marriage works the exact same way. Preventative maintenance is the secret. Okay. And I'll give you a very, very simple example. I am big on, I have to run to the supermarket, let me pick up some flowers. Oh, you sappy romantic, you, I love that. Yeah, but here's the thing, right? Oh, you sappy ro yes, it makes her happy, it's $8, it's not a big deal, it makes her happy. And it's preventative maintenance. If you are the kind of guy who only buys flowers when you're in trouble. <laughs> Which is what too many of us do. Right? Yeah. You come through the door with flowers. Now she's suspicious. What have you done? Or you've done something and now you try to buy the flowers because, you know, 
eight dollars worth of plants is going to solve whatever stupid thing you did yeah um, that's a problem right the thing that a lot of people don't remember is that love is both a noun and a verb and we treat it mostly like the noun we are in love right and and love is a thing and then oh look I'm no longer attracted to that person or you know she's on my nerves more than she's not and therefore I am now out of love with that person yeah but if you do your preventative maintenance right simple things we tell each other I love you once a day whether we need oh, to or man. not yeah and we don't we're not it, it's not like it's gonna be a big mystery right um, but we say it we make a point of doing little things we sit on the couch and I rub her feet I do not have a foot fetish they are mildly disgusting <laughs> If you do, I've got a couple of websites to recommend, footfetish.com. Yeah. I know there are people who do it. I have friends yeah. who are seriously, seriously into toes. I'm not one of them. <coughs> Excuse me. So she sits wait. on the couch. But these simple things that you're sharing with us right now, are these things that your duchess has inspired in you? Are these things that you realized through self-evaluation like, why did my previous relationships go wrong? Ah, you know why? It's because I didn't do this. I could have done more of that. Is it more about that, or is it also simply because you're compatible, you're aligned? Combination. I think I am very, very blessed in that my parents had an amazing love story relationship. I had an amazing uh, role model for what a marriage should look like. Yeah. Um, very different human beings in so many ways <laughs> and yet they were crazy about each other and they constantly did little things and they didn't insist on their way if it didn't matter and just things like that that work yeah um, and I think I mean it's it it's kind of like that right it's like the foot thing I, it's not my thing <laughs> but, but I but I like how you phrase it. She's on the it. couch it's... and the feet wind up in my lap. Guess yeah. what I'm doing? And you know why? Because it doesn't hurt me to do it, and it I makes like her happy. I think ultimately, what I'm hearing is you are focused on her well-being, sometimes over yours. And if that's reciprocated, then it's a match. Which it is every day. Yeah. So there it is, guys. It's it's pretty simple. Um, a healthy relationship comes down to honoring, valuing the other person, focusing on their well-being, and hopefully, hopefully, underlined, highlighted, it will be reciprocated. I think another element that has maybe been the success, uh, a, a crucial component of your success as a speaker, as a friend, as, as, a, as a husband, you have this incredible sense of humor, which Canadians, by the way, are known for, and one of your phrases is, Wayne, get over yourself. What does that mean? And how do you, how do you get over yourself? Well, it, it probably comes from an unhealthy sense of my place on the food chain. Um, you know, I, I figured out a long time ago, Galileo figured out in the 1400s that the center of the universe is not here. Uh, the universe is going to spin where it's going to spin. I have very little control over that. And so I think that some of it is just a good stoic, um, literally stoic in the Greek sense. Um, you know, life, pain is inevitable, misery is optional. Oh, is wow. Is kind of my, my motto. <laughs> that I so how do you, how do you what's the difference between pain and misery? Pain is bad stuff happens. Misery is how you let it affect you. Affects oh, you. Oh, yes, yes. So people are going to be crappy to you. You are going to go through bad things in life. Parents are going to die. Things are going to go, things are going to happen. How you face that, right, and choosing to be miserable is an option that far too many people go. They enjoy whining. They enjoy complaining. They take it out on other people. It manifests itself in a yeah. lot of different ways. 
um, science has actually shown that the behaviors that we reinforce, the, the brain strengthens and develops those very specific synapses. So if you complain a lot, you're wiring your brain to complain more. If you implement a lot of gratitude in your life, you wire your brain to be grateful for things and it elevates your joy level. So I, I, I completely get what you're saying there. Now, well, these things you know, it's denial. <laughs> denial gets an awfully bad rap. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, as Jeff Goldblum said in the, the Big Chill, I don't know anybody gets through the day without a couple of big, fat, juicy rationalizations. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, some of it is, yep, this sucks. So I can either go down the rabbit hole and complain about it, or I can in the worst case, find a way to be less miserable about it. Yeah. Or, in the best case, actually get off my behind and do something about it. Take an action. And over the course of your career, you obviously have taken action. And I, and I want to kind of ask you this question in terms of transitioning, reinvention. So once upon a time, tapping into your humorous Canadian side, you were a stand-up comic, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, straight out of high school. I actually put myself through college. Uh, doing stand-up. So you're, you're a stand-up comic where you don't want people to take you seriously. You want people to laugh with you, at you sometimes. Yet what you're doing now, you are, amongst other things, you're a corporate trainer. You need people to take you seriously. You need to come across as professional. How do you juggle those two personalities and how do you live in both those worlds? Well, it, it stems from authenticity, I think. I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to do this analysis because, you know, I'm patient zero here. Um, I, I think it stems from being authentic. You are who you are. Uh, humor is my coping mechanism sometimes. To ah, it's a coping less, mechanism. Well, of course it's a coping yeah. mechanism. Um, it, it says, look at me, look at me. It uh, de-stresses situations where as a small bookish kid in a redneck small town I could get my butt kicked for being caught reading um, you know, wow. there's lots of things that go on right and so humor became my my defense mechanism so it can be too much right it can be self-deprecating to the point of being destructive uh, you can be inappropriately humorous all that good stuff yeah but it also boils down to seeing the humor in a situation takes the teeth out of it. I like that. So this is the, 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 the strange thing about what you just shared, how it's an escape mechanism. And I look at some of our great comedic geniuses, the cliche sad clown. The tortured genius, the sure. The tortured geniuses who hide behind their humor. They bring laughter. Mm -hmm peace, escapism to the world, yet they themselves are living in misery. What, and I'm not asking you to be a psychologist, I'm just sort of asking you, what, what is your opinion on how these comedians experience this intense sense of loss, sadness, depression, yet they find the courage to go and make people laugh? Do you relate to that or is, is it a different... Oh, sure. Um, I absolutely relate to it. I mean, I remember I did a show in Victoria, B.C. the night my mother was buried. Um, you know, and the show must go on. And, and the reason is, when you make other people laugh, when you bring other people joy, the receptors in your brain, your little endorphins go off and the serotonin kicks in and all of yeah. that good stuff because you are getting a positive, it's, pos it's a positive feedback loop. Would you categorize it as a form of addiction? Because I remember in my Cirque du Soleil years, I was addicted to staring death in the face on a nightly basis and having that adrenaline rush. And then oh, yeah. when my career ended, something was missing. Something was no longer there that I thrived on. Did you go through withdrawal? Endorphins and serotonin are unbelievably addictive drugs. Um, so how, how think have you about, replaced? Think about what Think about the career of a stand-up comic. You start at open mics, and you die a hideous death as often as you get laughs at the beginning. Painful. Well, why would somebody stand on stage and willfully bring that on themselves, right? 
think about this, 75% of the world suffers some degree of stage fright. It's called glossophobia, right. fear of talking in front of others. For the other 25%, and I would warrant that for about 10% of them, including me, yeah. it's not just a fear, it's a need. It gives need. me my fix. It gives me what I need. I get the attention of strangers. They laugh at what comes out of my mouth. There is nothing better. I remember I opened for the band Chicago in oh, Saskatoon. Chicago, wow. 10,000 people in a hockey arena laughing at me and that applause comes over you like a wave and it is intoxicating and it's addictive. I get But that. it's also because one good show covers up a whole bunch of sins. That's how you get through the open mic process. That's how you learn to get past bombing and you uh, do that stuff because the rewards are so outsized. Yeah. To the, to the negative. So you basically overcome fear. Another thing that a lot of people face and in, in aging. No, 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 I haven't overcome fear. I've overcome that fear. Ah, you've overcome that fear. But a lot of things that happen with, at least for myself in, in becoming older, it becomes harder to face fear in, 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 to, face, to face fear and stare it in, in, in the face and for example, reinvention, you, you get to a certain age, midlife crisis, I used to be this, but I'm no longer that. Who am I today? Do I still have the energy, the desire to move into this other direction? You go through a reinvention. You're a stand-up comic. You then get into the world of training, consulting. You became an author. That's got to take a lot of cajones, a lot of balls to be, you know what, I'm giving up this part of my life I'm going to become that way over there. Yeah, invention, reinvention is an interesting thing. Most people are horribly afraid of it. Maybe it helps that I have the attention span of an Irish setter. <laughs> uh, because I love I'm Irish easily setters. Bored. Don't insult my people like that. I love Irish I, setters. I, I love Irish <laughs> setters too, but you know they aren't going to sit for the SATs. Right. True. Um, I think that reinvention comes from a couple of things. I mean, if we look at my career path, right? I started, I was a stand-up for 18 years, and then there were a couple of years in the wilderness where I didn't know what I wanted to be. And then I started in the training and consulting business, and the first few, and I was always a writer, you know, I, I tried the screenplay in LA thing and all of that. I became a pretty successful trainer consultant. I started writing books, all of a sudden that catches on. Well, then comes the opportunity. I leave LA and move to Chicago. Do I pack up my family and move to a city where we don't know anybody? Yep, because that's the deal. Okay. I tend to follow the opportunities. And then we're in Chicago, and I've been now written several books, business books. They've been well received. I get it in my head to write a novel. And, I lo I'm, gonna, and I'm glad you bring that up because um, I've gone through a similar journey. And I think people often we go through that journey where depending on who we hang out with we we are different people we show different side of of Absolutely. who we are with this group and and but when it comes to career some people choose this but really in my personal life i'm i'm this over here and they don't always align you have found well, the you balance. asked me though you asked me very specifically you know there's this funny wacky whatever side and then you know there's the grown up corporate got to wear big boy clothes side of the equation but writing and being creative is an outlet that allows me to vent some of that steam ah but then still you live in two worlds you you write these the titles crack me up unto themselves you wrote you're a you classify yourself as a historical fiction writer yet i mean one of your titles is acres orphans and then acres bastard what is all that about, followed by the long-distance leader and the long-distance teammate? I mean, well, it gets how the weirder hell do you do that. that shit? So let me give you the progression. I'm writing these books, um, Six Weeks to a Great Webinar, Meet Like You Mean It. I'm, I'm you know, establishing myself as the guy, right? Because you know when you write a book, that gives you a gravitas and a... Uh, credibility that may or may not be deserved, but by golly, people give it to you, bless their yeah. hearts. So I'm establishing myself as this, 
this business guy, right? And long distance leader is actually a big old hit. It's in five languages and it's driving our business and it's terrific. And long distance teammate is the sequel which comes out in January. So there's this trajectory that I'm on, right? But in the meantime, I get this bug that I will never be a real writer until I write a novel. Ah. So six years ago, I write this historical novel, The Count of the Sahara, and darn if people didn't like it. Didn't buy it, but they liked it. And, uh, and I enjoyed doing it. So then I wrote the next historical novel, which was Acra's Bastard, which is still a historical fiction novel. It's just a different period of time. And Acra's Orphans is the sequel to that. Uh, so now I've yeah, got okay. two careers going. I've got this, um, you know, this big boy grown up consultant thing where I've got business people reading my book and I'm being interviewed by big important business magazines. And, and that's lovely because it's only taken me 55 of my 59 years <laughs> to actually make a buck. <laughs> you did it. So, Good. So do you feel, but, do you live authentically in both those worlds? Yeah, I do. I, I really do because the, the creative silly side of me, I mean, and this is where the journey gets even weirder, right? So then I start writing these historical fiction things. So I've got two worlds, right? I'm wearing the hat today because this is my personal author branding. Ah. Right? If I'm wearing the hat, I'm Wayne the author guy. Yeah and I'm a different person than I am when I am speaking, you know, delivering a keynote at a conference yes. or something like that. But here's the thing, so I've got these trajectories going and then my new novel, which comes out November 19th, is my fourth novel. This one is an urban fantasy about a detective who's a werewolf. What? <laughs> I love it. Right? Yeah. It, it's like all of a sudden, it's not bad enough that I've reinvented myself as a historical fiction author. It's like, oh, guess what? That box is too tiny. I'm going to write this other really weird, silly thing. Yeah. Which I, it's taken me almost a year where I can tell people the subject of the book without feeling embarrassed about it. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> but I can, darn it. To a point that you brought up about going back to living in two worlds. So what I do, because I, like you, I, I live in the world of corporate training and I get to travel, or I used to get to travel and speak on large stages. Yeah, to remember the good old days? The good old days. And then sometimes now I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. But what I always do in both worlds, I always have to connect to my ability to be free to express. So for example, I love eccentric socks. So whether I'm on stage for a bunch of executives, I'm wearing the eccentric socks because it always grounds me to who I truly am. And it always, you know, if, if we can live with authenticity, I think it enables us to navigate life with vigor, with enthusiasm, with, with a focus. I want to quickly shift gear and hit you with some fast, rapid answer questions. Wayne, do you have any regrets? Do I have any regrets? Not in the great cosmic scheme of things. I have things I wish I hadn't done, and Lord knows there's plenty of those. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of great cosmic regrets, I don't know. I've got one bucket list item, ah. which it will absolutely kill me if I don't, which is I have to take the Duchess to Paris at some point. <laughs> That's what she that said about is, For all kinds of reasons, important yeah. to her, important to me. That's the one thing on my bucket list. If yeah. I should pass before I do that, that will be a huge regret. And I highly recommend you do take it to Paris. It is a marvelous city. C'est une ville merveilleuse, incroyable, magnifique, très romantique. Next question, Wayne. What is your favorite sound? My sound is laughing children playing. Yes, you're getting all James Lipton on me. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, this is where I got this from, James Lipton. I know, I recognize the, the questions. And, and my answer, like yours, is a four-year-old kid laughing their butt off is the best thing in the universe. <laughs> there is nothing better than a little kid just laughing fit to bust. I that totally, I best. totally agree. It changes our mood. It's, it's incredible. Um, what is your favorite curse word? You know, I was raised extremely Baptist. I was raised in the church, man. This was, <laughs> and so it's an old, oldie but a goodie. And it's goddamn. Goddamn. And what I love about goddamn is it has, it wears many hats. 
right? It's kind of, well, this goddamn thing. But it's also just <laughs> yeah. that feeling when you don't know what else to say, you're just like, God damn. I love that. My favorite is the F word. Um, there's this very thing, a funny list by a, an author called something Sullivan, Peter Sullivan maybe, and he has a list of 12 times, 10 times in history when the F word was appropriate. One of them was, what the F was that? Mayor of Hiroshima. Yes. They'll never effing find out. Bill Clinton. Yep. Um, it so effing looks like her, Pablo Picasso, and the list is hilarious. So for me, right. the F word is, is my favorite word. Um, because it is the ultimate F word. We are talking about an... But interestingly, there is, no, there is no scripture that says thou shalt not use the F word. There is a scripture that says you shall not say goddamn. There you go. So fuck that shit. All right, here we go. So yeah, if I'm, gonna, if, if I'm going to hell, I'm riding the right toboggan, man. I am not going for something I didn't do. What the beep? All right, last question. This is really profound, ending on a, on a, on a high or a low, depending on how you want to look at it. You've navigated through life. How would you, what impact would you like to think you left on the planet? Yeah, I, I, it's funny because I know that's not the way the original question was written. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read, at the end of your no, no, life, no. what impact would you like to think you left no, no, on the planet? Here, so here, here's your answer. Um, my father passed away early this year and I had to go to Canada for the funeral and I remember standing up in front of the thing. And there was something that uh, I recalled, which I think, I hope applies to me. And, and they said, a man dies three times. The first is when the spirit leaves the body. The second time is when the last person who knew that person passes away. Yes. And then the third time is the last time that person's name is spoken. Oh, yes. And I would like to believe that I leave enough of an impact on people that I will be remembered, the impact of something I taught them or something that they read of mine or some silly memory sticks with me and they pass that on to somebody else and so that. that it doesn't all end when this goes away. Dude, that was effing awesome, goddammit. <laughs> I love what you just said we there. We die, we, can, man. we die three times, and that maybe is the key to eternal life. You think of people like Tutankhamun. Technically, they haven't completely died because we still revel in, in their legacy, and their name is ongoing. So, Wayne, what a pleasure. Do send my love to the lovely Duchess. Send me a postcard from Gay Paris. That's what they used to call it, Gay Paris, meaning it's Yeah, well, you happy. know they won't let us in the country. <laughs> I know so that is who a shame. Knows when that that's is a shame. Happen. And I can't wait for that, uh, for Canada to open its borders because I want to go visit Vancouver. So Wayne, good luck with the books. When does it come out again? You said January. Okay, so uh, Johnny Lichen and the Anubis Disc, which is the werewolf detective novel, uh, went on for pre-sale today actually, but pub date is November nineteenth. Awesome. awesome. And the long distance teammates stay engaged and connected, working anywhere. Uh, it, the audio book is out now. Uh, the book book comes out January 21st. Love that. Go check it out, guys. I've read some of uh, Wayne's books. Um, highly recommend them, whether you are into leadership or you just want a great sense of escapism. Wayne, it's been a pleasure. You schizophrenic comedian slash leader slash strange, weird author guy who has an amazing uh, wife who likes to get her feet massaged in the couch. Wayne, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us here on My Just pleasure, Another brother. Take care, Wayne. Bye-bye.